4-9 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on your door frames, on your houses and on your gates. Matthew twenty-two, thirty-four to forty. Hearing, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them had, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question: "Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law?" Jesus replied. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and prophets hang on these two commandments. May God bless the reading of his word. Thanks. morning. It is my great pleasure to introduce my friend Jill. Jill and her husband Len, uh, were, uh, they served as missionaries uh, with CMS uh, for one year in the Northern Territory and then 10 years in Hong Kong. She is a lecturer in the Old Testament at Ridley College and she is an excellent scholar and has a very busy writing schedule. Jill is a very generous person. I believe um, we don't simply share a love for scripture, we also share many other Christian values. In fact, we were both uh, on a theological advisory group of an organization called Common Grace. For a little while, less than one year, uh, I really enjoyed our conversations over the years. So Jill, welcome to our church. We look forward to what you are going to share with us this morning. Thank you, Siu Fung. I'm just practicing the microphone. I'm going to say per. Now I'm going to say per again. That's better. All right. Is that hearing all right? Yeah, great. Um, it's great to be with you. I've met a few people that I've met already in other settings, like Siu Fung's book launch and someone who's got a friend who was at Ridley and stuff like that. So um, lovely to be in contact, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of you or all of you, if you're quick, um, after the service. Just, I can't see that, you can see it. All right, I've got this magic thing. Let's pray. Lord, may we see you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. So, Siu Fung asked me to speak about the Shema, and thank you, Emily, for uh, reading that so nicely. And uh, I've chucked in Matthew 22. It's one of three um, renditions in the New Testament. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. They're all slightly different, so that's fun to have a look at that. We won't have time today, but um, we'll also talk a little bit very briefly about Jesus there. Just checking that worked. Good, good on me. Okay, so Moses spoke these words when they were preparing to go into the promised land. And this is chapter 6. Chapters 1 to 4 is Moses recounting the story of how he led them out, uh, how God led them out of Egypt and how he rescued them and all his love towards them. And chapter 5 is the Ten Commandments, and then this is chapter 6, which kind of builds on those things. 
the great commandment, I'm a success, the great commandment, um, Jesus says that these commandments, this commandment is the greatest commandment. So we might think, oh, Old Testament, never mind, I don't have to care about that. But here we go, it's in the New Testament as well. Jesus says this is really important. And he says, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself, that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you're like me and there are 618 or 628 commandments in the Old Testament and not all of them apply to us now anyway, that could be too hard, but most of us can remember two two rules, and we're only going to look at one today, so it shouldn't be stretching too many people's brains. So uh, what are we going to look at today? We're going to look at the Shema first, and then why we should love God 24-7, which is the title of the sermon, and then how can we love. There are a few tips in this text, so there's many more tips, but just taking what we've got in the text. So looking at the beginning here, the first bit is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. So it's a communal message. So of course we all have to take it individually and we'll come to that, but it's also something to hear together. Israel was there gathered and heard it together. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or alone. It's just the word, the word for one. You know, one, two, three, four, five. It's it's the Hebrew word for one, echad. So it just says Yahweh echad. So there's like books and books and books written about this. So I won't go into that in a lot of detail, um, but I'll just give you a few little angles that might help you think about what does it mean that God is one. In Zechariah. It has this exactly the same expression, Yahweh um, one, um, Yahweh echad. And in Zechariah 14, 9, it says, the Lord will then be king over all the earth. So the first point about this, when it's coming towards uh, Yahweh is one, is that he's, he's like the most important. He's number one. So there's count one, two, three, four, and there's being number one. And then it says, um, on that day the Lord will be one, or there will be one Lord, is another way of translating that bit, and one name. So he's number one, and he's the greatest. You know, whatever you're thinking about other stuff, all the other names will drop away and it'll just be him. He will be number one. And then in the Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 8 to 9, it has this uh, slightly, when I read it to you, the first bit's a bit funny, but the last bit's good. There may be 60 queens and 80 concubines and young women without number, but she is the one for me, or she is unique is another way, and this is she and one. So this in this part of Song of Songs, the lover speaks to the beloved and he says she is number one so we can get from this you are number one god Uh, you're the one and only and then perhaps from song of songs you are the only one for me so other people could worship other people but i'm going to stick with you god so the next bit verse five Um, It says, and you shall love the Lord your God in in Hebrew. So the and can be so. So it could be and, it could be but, but I don't think that would work here. So I think it's so. So he he is the one. So how are we going to respond to that? We're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and, um, and might. No mind in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Heart, soul, strength. With all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength. Not a little bit for God and other bits of anywhere, all for him. Now, I'm um, just going to give you a little um, Princess Bride Inigo Montoya moment. I don't think this means what you think it means. These are three Hebrew words, and they all mean something slightly different than what we get in English. So we've got the word heart, 
But in the Old Testament, it means the mind or the will. Okay, so if you read heart in the Old Testament, we're talking about the mind and the will. The feelings are down, down lower uh, in the kidneys. You get terrible feelings in your kidneys and sometimes your intestines, old translation bowels. Um, you know, the, the bowels get all sort of twisted up when we're worried and the kidneys hurt when we're afraid and things like that. So heart is actually the mind and the will. The soul is not a part of you, it's the whole being in, in the Old Testament. So where you see soul, um, bless the Lord, O my soul, that's from Psalm 103 or 104, um, that means the whole of me, not just the soul can bless you or my hands are out stealing things or something like that. And then with all our might, which does mean strength, and some of us as we get older have got less of that than we had before, but it also means possessions. So it's not just my body, my strength body, but also everything I own. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. So if, and so we could summarize that as I give my whole self to you. So these two verses together, you are number one, the one and only. You're the only one for me. I give my whole self to you. And then from here we go into some instruction about how to follow this through. Verse 6 says, keep these words that I am commanding you today. So these words could just be the Shema, and some people think of it that way, but um, the whole book of De Deuteronomy in Hebrew is called words because the first bit is these are the words that God spoke blah 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 so it could be that we're talking about the whole of Deuteronomy so I'm not going to try and tell you how to keep the whole of Deuteronomy today I think the Shema will be enough but just bear in mind that it could be um, a lot more that is being involved here more detail keep them today in your hearts and remember this is your mind and your will when I uh, but who wants a whole lot of rules in their heart, right? Who, who wants them in their mind? Like, you know, aren't rules just annoying? Well, when I was seven, I went interstate and I went to a new school. And at that new school, it was awful because they wouldn't tell you anything about the rules until you broke one. So I was, I was seven, right? And I did whatever it was. I smiled one time. That wasn't allowed in that school. It was a horrible school. Um, and my husband told me he had an experience like that when he went to a theological college where they did the same thing. So um, you're not even safe in theological college. So, you know, sometimes not knowing the rules can be really awful. Sometimes it's really helpful to know how things work so that you know uh, what to do. And on the way here, I live in Brunswick and I came along the freeway and there was a bit where everybody was going 80 and I'm like, my lane is going 80, that lane is, why are they all going 80? And I'd been a bit distracted and when I looked up it was because there were roadworks. So everybody was going 80 because, you know, they were trying not to kill people on the road. So sometimes we think, oh, this is stupid, what, what's happening here? But actually that rule is to help us. That rule can be there to make us safer. So I've got Mary there treasuring the words in her heart. This is after... Um, the shepherds come and tell her all the wonderful things that the angels have said. And she treasured these words and pondered them in her heart. So that's an invitation to us to treasure and ponder the Shema and to try and get further into its meaning. So uh, why? Why should we bother? Well, Amanda, um, leading us in the communion, said the whole point of the communion is about God's love, right? We do remember everything that Jesus did for us, but the point is, he loved us so much, he even went to the cross. And this is the same, this is the reason that we get these rules to love God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. In Deuteronomy 6, this is the beginning of the chapter, it says, Hear, O Israel, the same as we just had, and observe his decrees and commandments diligently, so that it may go well with you not so that you can have a horrible life or so I can control you, sorry, because I'm controlling or anything like that. But because I love you. And this word um, 
it may go well with you. It's using a Hebrew word tov, which just means good. And it's the same word as in creation where God says, um, you know, let there be this and that and the other thing. And God saw and it was good. So we're being taken back to the creation goodness, which as we've heard and as we know from our teaching has been bent. You know, it's not, it's not completely gone, but there's all kinds of things that have kind of damaged the creation goodness. But glory to Jesus um, in his um, new creation. He says, behold, I'm making all things new. So as we try and uh, live our lives as God has invited us to, he's restoring in us that goodness that he meant us to have from the beginning so that things would go well with us. So a summary for this section, the reason to keep their words, these words in our hearts is because God loves us so much and he's offered us these words as a way that will help us so that things will go well with us, so that we can be getting back, having restored what God originally intended for us. So we get a few tips now, actual practical tips. Um, there's some practical tips about passing um, faith on to children and some for ourselves and actually we make a trans transition in the middle of this verse but it kind of goes both ways anyway let me do it so verse 7 yeah here we go says in different translations recite them to your children or teach them to your children. Or I think the one we had today was impress them on your children. It's using a Hebrew word. This is the last Hebrew word for the day. The Hebrew word shanan, which is to sharpen. And everywhere else in the Old Testament, this word is about sharp things. So Deuteronomy is about God's sharp sword. Um, Psalm 45 is about the king's sharp arrows. Psalm 64 is about the sharp tongue when the enemies kind of try and cut David to pieces with their nasty things that they're saying. And Psalm 73 is about being um, sad and bitter and it's like a sword is stabbing him in his kidneys. Uh, it uses that kidney word there. Um, so we've got heart there, but it's really kidneys. But if you read that in the Bible, I mean, maybe I have to ask you afterwards in Chinese, maybe you don't get pains in your heart either. You might get them somewhere else in your body. But um, yeah, it's, it's actually kidneys there. So this doesn't mean that we should stab our children or that we should say sharp, nasty t things to them or that we should try and upset them so that they'll feel grieved in their kidneys. It's, it's none of those things going on there. Um, but it might be helpful to think about how we say, she's pretty sharp or that was a sharp argument, or there's another text, iron sharpens iron, where we think about understanding things better. You know, we've got this blurry idea and then somebody talks about it with us and we, ah, oh, now I get that. So I'll come back to that um, at the end. Um, there'll be, a, there's another bit later in the text that talks about the children. Uh, verse 7b. It says, so it says, talk about them, teach them to your children, talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. It's literally when you are walking on the road. So where do we um, talk about these things? When we're home and when we're away. Everywhere, right? You're either home or you're away. And you might have a few homes, but you can just work that out. Um, and particularly... Um, I think it's fun when you're walking on the road, when you're travelling, you know, so that perhaps there's a little imprimatur for listening to scripture on your car radio or in your Walkman while you're uh, public transporting or whatever. When I hear these words, walking on the road, I immediately um, connect to Psalm 119, 128, which says, I hate every wrong path. When we were living in Hong Kong, uh, we were there for about 10 years. We um, used to go up to Lantau, you know, where the, the airport's there now, but it's before the airport was there. But they, actually, the planes go over very, very close. And there are these little um, concrete cabins that were put there in the 1920s for missionaries. And actually, some um, missionaries hid there during the war, and the Japanese never found them. It's an amazing story. People were carrying food up to them, and they, they were safe there. Um, 
but anyway, we used to go that you, you, you got a ferry and all that stuff and then you walk up the mountain, you go through the clouds, usually with a thunderstorm, so there's lightning striking and you know, water pouring down, your shoes are all disgusting and go all smelly because there's no electricity at the top. And then you go in one of these little cabins which has got like a tank and you use like a little um, gas cooker thing that you carry the gas up yourself. Anyway, uh, there are about 30 cabins and we would stay in one and other people would be in others. And when you went to visit, you'd go down the hill or up the hill, depending on where you were, to visit. And one day I'd been to visit someone and I was coming down the hill um, to go back to my cabin and I left it a little bit late and I hadn't been looking carefully out either because I'm a city person. And the fog had risen, like it was actually the cloud, you know, it had come up higher and I couldn't see my cabin and I couldn't see the path to my cabin. And I'm on the top of Lantau Peak alone, <laughs> lost in the fog. And there are, I don't know if you've ever been there, but there are cows that wander around and you could fall off the cliff, of course, as well. So I'm just standing there like, where do I go? What do I do? And I was praying because I thought this could be the end or I have to sit here all night or whatever. And these words came to me, I hate every wrong path. And they're really connected with me because sometimes there are things in the Bible I think, ah, oh, you know, I like this bit, but that bit sort of annoys me a bit. But I hate every wrong path. It kind of brought to me that all of God's word is precious and, um, and should be beloved because all his ways are good, even the ones that we don't really get the point about. So we've talked about um, where we should um, be thinking and talking about these words. And then now we're to when. Um, verse 7c, the end of this says, when you lie down and when you rise. Um, so, you know, lie down, going to bed first and then getting up in the morning. Um, my Facebook gives me messages, and this is, this is not the one. There's a really good cartoon lady, but I couldn't get her for this. Um, it, it tells me I should do chair yoga, and if I do it for seven minutes a day, or sometimes there's a different ad that says 10 minutes, so seven to 10 minutes, then I could get the body of a 20-year-old. Right, everyone's laughing, right? Right, if you, if you do chair yoga and it's true, come and tell me afterwards. Um, but sadly... This text is telling us that we can't just achieve loving God in seven minutes a day. Um, when it says when you lie down and when you get up, that's like old and young. When you say this, this um, dinner is for old and young, you don't mean the middle-aged people can't come. You mean from the old to the young and everything in between. So where it says here when you lie down and when you get up, that means there's no break all day. But at least it's while you're awake. It's not that one that says you have to pray through the night. So all day, whatever we're doing, we are um, to be loving God with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. Then it has these three very specific tips about what to do for yourself, for the people in your home who could be blood family or could be different people living together, and for, your, uh, for the people of God as a whole. First one is to bind them as a sign on your hand. So Jewish people actually do this. Jewish men used to be the only ones, but now some women do it. Um, when you put it on your hand, they, they put a straps sort of like all through the hand and they bind something on here, which contains the Shema. And they also put a little box on the head and they, um, which has the Shema in it. So they're taking that literally. Um, you can see the tattoo. I just got that off the internet. I don't know if the person's Jewish or Christian, but it's also the Shema and you could now get a little tattoo if you would like to. I'm not suggesting this, I'll go on to say what I think you should do, but um, if you took it literally, you'd be tattooing or you know, wearing little um, things on your head and on your hand. And the point of it is that it's everything you do with your hands and again, all your thinking and your will. So the inner person and the outer person um, putting this into practice for every single person, not just the pastor or the elders or anything like that. And secondly, it gives us a tip for um, the family or the people living in a home. It says, write them, this is the sh possibly the Shema again, um, on the doorposts of your home. And Jewish people do this. They have that little uh, box. I haven't got one of those little arrow things, but you can see the black 
thing on the doorpost of the house, and in that is the Shema. And um, the next to it one is people going for a celebration of placing that there because it's a new home and they put that there and they're saying this is how we're going to live, loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. So um, we don't have to do that, but we can think about how loving God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength can be part of our home life. And then the third one is write them on your gates. And this, again, is a true thing. So this is the... I'm sorry, I'm pointing there because my pictures are there. You have to look that way, obviously. Um, on the... Up here, uh, it's at the Jaffa Gate, and that's a great big mezuzah because the text would be in bigger letters. And again, um, it's, it contains the Shema, saying that the whole community of God's people should live by God's words. Now, we do this as well, don't we? We have mottos on the gate. So this is uh, Selwyn College, which is in um, Cambridge. And this one says, it's in Greek, but the translation, which I got off Google, is be courageous. Um, yeah. There are all kinds of other ones, but let me move to this one, which is perhaps a little bit not so nice, sorry. Um, this is the motto on the gate at Auschwitz. And it says, Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes free. And the person who read that's a quote from someone else, and it was, you know, in a good setting, but that's been put there. And obviously what was done in that camp was evil. So it's perhaps a little reminder that a good motto is not enough. We actually have to put it into practice in our lives. So just turning to the children. Deuteronomy 6, this is further down in verse 20, says, when your children ask you, so sometimes we think, oh, I've got something I have to tell the children, bleh, bleh. but <laughs> this is a responsive um, method as well. Um, Jewish teaching is like this. If you read the Gospels carefully, you see that Jesus asks questions, he answers questions, and that's typical of rabbis. So when your children come and ask you in time to come, what is the meaning of the decrees, the statutes, and the ordinances that the Lord our God commanded you? Now, this is probably talking again about the whole book of Deuteronomy, not just the Shema, but we can use it um, in that smaller section. It's a good reminder to be responsive to the questions of our children and to have a look at Moses' answer because he, he, it's, this is like a rhetorical question. He says, what will you do when they ask you this? And he says, I'll tell you the answer. So his answer could be a little bit surprising. We could think, well, you know, you explain that this rule means this and that rule means that, and there would be room for that. But his answer is to tell two stories. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and he brought us out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And we should keep these rules and laws. Um, he says to fear the Lord, but again, um, we're drawing from the communion and it, in the Old Testament, to fear the Lord is to love him. So, um, because we love him. But it's not just like you have to do these things. Sometimes we're a bit thick with instructions and um, information to children. We, we sing these beautiful worship songs and then when we're telling our children, we're like, God says this, you know, you should do that, instead of, um, you know, getting into the, the wonderful stories that really communicate uh, to children. So what to tell children today? Um, tell your story. And now I'm with Daphne, you know, that we sang Amazing Grace. So there's a story there, there's a whole story. And we all have our own story. Um, there are bits probably that you wouldn't tell children at this time, but there are parts that maybe you would. So think about your own story, what you could pass on to your children or your grandchildren. And of course you can tell other people's stories. It don't has to be only your own. There's all kinds of wonderful stories out there about what it means um, to love God with your whole heart. And also tell Jesus' story. So Old Testament stories are really great. I'm an Old Testament lecturer. I you know, very much focus on the Old Testament. But we all also need to know Jesus' story. 
uh, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, that he's sitting at the right hand now, that he's coming back in glory. These things are, you know, wonderful things to talk about with children. Um, his miracles, his love, um, they, they're all good things to talk about. Also thinking about God's love, it's kind of helpful to think about how we talk about it. Um, when my children were really little, they're all grown up now and some of them have their own children, but when they were little, I, did, had, I didn't grow up as a Christian myself. I wasn't a Christian and my family weren't Christians. So I'm like, how do you bring up you know, children in the faith when you never had anything yourself? I think we might have had one Bible study, Bible Bible storybook that my aunt gave us, but it was just on the shelf with everything. Nobody actually believed it. Um, so I read this book, and it was actually a Catholic book, and it said that you should make the time where you're teaching your children, when you're sharing faith with your children, something to look forward to. Sit on the best chairs in your house, or if they're floor dwellers, you know, go on bean bags or a nice rug. Um, Offer a smoothie or some kind of treat. You know, this is the time to bring out the chocolate biscuits. This is not the time to be sitting on a chair while, you know, one of the parents tells you what to do. Make it really enjoyable. Um, maybe singing, whether you sing yourselves or whether you um, have music in the background, you know, whatever works in your um, family, your home. Um, blessings. In our family, um, when we lived in Hong Kong, the children were... Um, primary school age, and they had to go on a school bus at like 7 a.m. So blah, blah, blah. And then as they went out the door, we'd have a blessing, rather as well as, have you got your shoes? Don't forget your flute. You know, where, where's your breakfast and all that stuff. But to make the last thing not some instruction, but a blessing. Um, because we want them to taste and see that the Lord is good. We don't want them just to hear about it and to know that we think that. We want to give them every experience we can of the love of God. Conclusion. So we thought about what the Shema says. Um, what it says to God, you are number one in the universe, the only one, the one and only. You are the only one for me. And then I give my whole self to you, all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. Why would we go into God in this amount of power? Because God's plan is shalom and his love is driving him. And he gives us these suggestions or these rules about what to do because he wants things to go well with us. It's not because he wants to wreck our lives. He wants things to go well with us. And this is helping us for things to go well. And then the last bit of the text gave us some practical tips that it has to be wherever we are, all day and every day, 24-7, that we can pass on our own story and the story of God and that we can taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you.